Today's conversation builds on the foundation of multi-arm bandits. Bandit problems represent an essential conflict that we have in human nature. Choosing actions which yield immediate benefit now versus choosing actions which might yield benefit somewhat later on, jam tomorrow. Multi-arm bandits are best explained through this analogy. A gambler at a row of slot machines needs to decide which machine to play, how many times to play, and which machines to play on. When played, each machine will give a reward which is specific to a distribution from that machine. The objective is to maximize a reward earned through a sequence of lever pulls. Dr. Walter Kulin gives us his take on multi-arm bandits. So it's in some sense an abstraction, but so what are the ingredients? So you have these things called arms, an interface if you want. An arm is something you can, you can pull it, it's what it's called. And what it does is a sample is generated from some unknown distribution that is behind this arm. So in a multi-arm bandit, you have a collection of arms and you can ask for samples interactively. So you ask for a sample, you see what, what you got, and you go to another arm, ask for a sample, and you keep on going like this. And I guess one, one popular application would be uh, clinical trials. So then you think of each treatment that you're testing as one of these bandit arms, and you think of uh, pulling such an arm as uh, getting another patient and applying this treatment to this patient and, and observing the effect. If the effect is quite fast, then you can really use the feedback from this single patient in, to update your knowledge about the treatments. So maybe for the next patient, you would like, if the patient worked, if the treatment worked well, on the next patient, you might want to give it again. Uh, and if it didn't work so well, you may want to weight it down. Okay, that's what a, what a bandit is. So it's basically several unknown probability distributions. Multi-arm bandits are theoretically a really interesting problem. And the reason for that is schematically, they represent many other more sophisticated problems. The scientific answer is these problems are baby versions of the problem that we really would like to solve, where they are distilled to a level where all the interesting features are still there. So what is pure exploration? Well, pure exploration means not exploiting anything. An example of this is AlphaGo, which does pure exploration through simulation and self-play. But it turns out you can do pure exploration in the real world. For example, clinical trials. So the process is pure exploration when the objective is not to maximize the reward itself, but to come up with a recommendation to maximize the reward. So in these decision theoretical frameworks, there's always an exploration versus exploitation trade-off. An example of an approach to ameliorate this is the epsilon greedy algorithm. So most of the time, 90% of the time, select the lever that you know is the best one. But 10% of the time, have a uniform random sample. Choose a lever randomly and just see what happens. So classically, this is this exploration, exploitation trade-off. And you have a framework that you call pure exploration. Now, as I understand it, you can still use, it's not just, it's not as simple as saying, let's just do exploration. So what do you understand under pure exploration and how does that play in? How can you do exploitation using pure exploration? The other end of the spectrum is the trial that you're running because you want to mass produce one of your drugs. Okay, so you're doing the trial to figure out which of these drugs you're going to roll out in the world. <laughs> so you're not really caring about curing the patients. What's important is that you want to find out which of these drugs works best. Because that's for the example, one. a COVID vaccine, for this example. This is super current, yes. <laughs> Maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah. So this is the regime in which the COVID trials are being done. Is it fair to say that the pure exploration setting is some sort of a setting where the reward is a sort of information gain? That's exactly okay. right. So we'll be talking about these two settings a lot. Wouter gives another example of pure exploration in the context of a board game. 
you want to have the best possible recommendation for the move to take. And after all that process is finished, you send the move over to the real board and one move is made. But that one you can never retract, you made it, it's, it's committed. So all that process was used to make that move really good. So this is a pure exploration. Wouter goes on to discuss generalized bandits and even bandits which may become intractable. I think the adversarial one is really in a category on its own. <laughs> so in the stochastic bandit model, the thing to learn exists. It is the full parametrization of the true model. <laughs> Whereas in an adversarial setting, all the structure evaporates and the amount of exploration you need, even for reward maximization, is just higher because you have to catch the opponent changing the patterns. Mm -hmm. In some sense, it's funny, but I always... So exploration is, in that sense, you use it as a threat. I might look everywhere. <laughs> right, right. So don't try to hide a reward that I'm not seeing. We talk about the wide applicability of multi-arm banded analysis to such things relevant today, like COVID vaccine development and trials, or solving different social policy problems. Did I prescribe the right one? It's not important that I know which one is the right one at the end. I just have to have handed it out a lot. There's a new class of problem here, the ethical multi-arm bandit. Yeah, so I think regulatory agencies have something to say about these things. Mm -hmm. And it can even range much farther than that. Problems of agents running in your home or even more general settings. But to spin this a little bit further, it seems that the framework is applicable to so much more. I'm, I'm thinking of any agent being deployed anywhere as something like this, for example. Yeah, let's go back to your, your classic reinforcement learning problem. You have a robot, you deploy it in a house, and the first thing it could do is simply to go and explore, right? Such that it can then, after that, do a certain task or any task as good as possible. We explore what Wouter calls a renaissance in multi-arm bandit analysis. Lower bounds that have become so tight that they actually enable the calculation of optimal algorithms that are not only optimal asymptotically, but optimal in practical scenarios with finite samples. That could be extremely useful for people designing clinical trials. They could definitely understand something like, look, the, the recommendation is that you do linear proportioning or logarithmic or whatever. Do we have that kind of catalog today of heuristics for different scenarios? I, I like this question. I think here the answer, my feeling is the answer is yes. So I, I think of this as the sort of the renaissance in pure exploration. It, it says you can get extremely close to optimality on large samples. So this is what this asymptotic optimality, the excitement that it gave, like we can have the constant factor equal to one on top of the lower bound in our algorithms. We can really squeeze everything out. Yep. So for best arm, the asymptotics kick in quite early. So for practical sample sizes, these algorithms are, are just the, the best we have. Yet the story is mixed and there seems to be some high sensitivity of the algorithm to those lower bounds. Small changes in the bounds actually can result in fundamentally different algorithms. How much do you think these refinements to those bounds would qualitatively change the algorithms that are optimal? Yeah, so I think, unfortunately, the algorithms are very different. Mm. So the, the, the examples in which the non-confidence terms are dominant have different lower bounds with that term being the dominant one. And then the algorithms that match those look very different again. So if you want to quantify this in uh, regret maximization, you play suboptimal arms logarithmically often. This is in the stochastic setting, but I think this is what we're currently talking about. In the pure exploration, you're handing out suboptimal drugs linearly often. Mm -hmm. So a, a fixed fraction of your trial is spent on handing out all the bad drugs just to make sure <laughs> that they really are worse. So between logarithmic and linear is an, is an enormous distinction. Yeah. Right? If you run either algorithm in the for the one task in the other one, it's really not going to do very well. 
I think so. The, the problem is you're facing this impossibility that an algorithm that's good for one is not going to be good for the other. This makes it difficult to offer general heuristics or guidelines for a practitioner who may not be able to conduct a thorough analysis of their particular problem. But here there seems to be hope. The possibility of creating what Wouter calls a pure exploration compiler. Okay, so this is my dream. I've, <laughs> I've been writing research proposals about this. I know it's impossible and it's crazy, but still I think it's a very nice goal. So I, I call it yeah. the pure exploration compiler. So you can look at that lower bound, <laughs> fill in the details of your problem, crank the technology and out comes an, almost an, it's an algorithm. What would that look like? If there were a contract or a domain specific language or some kind of concise description, what would the minimal contract be? We had a bit of fun too, learning about a particularly fearsome multi-armed bandit that Tim brought with him to graduate school. For Tim, who at some point came in with a truck and, and offloaded the largest monster desktop I ever saw with lights and, and everything. <laughs> and then he decided to overclock it to about twice the clock frequency. <laughs> and then at some point there were these blue screens now and then that were interrupting all the experiments going on. We also had a bit of light-hearted banter at the end of the show about quantum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should like do street talk quantum something. I hear companies getting funding for things that have nothing to do with what the company does, but they like right. frame their work in a way is, oh yeah, we got some COVID funding. It's like you do, you're like you do nothing, nothing. Quantum, with COVID. quantum like, bottled oh, yeah, yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's, <laughs> it's all a matter of framing to get these government money things. Blockchain coffee. Anyway, we've really delved into the theoretical side of machine learning in today's episode. I've not really seen this side of machine learning in a long time. It brings me back to my uh, PhD in computer science days. Do you like this kind of content? Was it heavy going? Did we do a good enough job of explaining it? Uh, let us know in the comments. I'm super excited about some of the episodes we have in the pipeline ready to go. We have got some absolutely incredible episodes coming up. So yeah, I'm excited about it. And of course, we'll be releasing those over, over the Christmas period. So um, I hope you're looking forward to it as well. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. And we'll see you back very soon. Enjoy the episode. And thanks for joining us. Here we are. And welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast with my two compadres, MIT PhD Keith Duggar and Yannick Lightspeed Kilcher. Now today we have an incredibly special guest, Dr. Wouter Kulin. I did my PhD with Wouter actually, and what I remember most fondly about Wouter is the distinctive way in which he used to answer his phone. He used to say, this is Wouter. And I could still remember that really clearly 10 years on. But Wouter was super deep into decision theoretic online learning, and in particular, prediction with expert advice at the time, which is what I was doing as well on my PhD. Wouter is definitely the smartest person I've ever met in real life. One thing I know for sure, if it wasn't for Wouter, I wouldn't have a PhD now. He spent countless hours explaining things to me and just giving me starting points and research ideas, and I'm forever in his debt for that. Wouter is a computer scientist and senior researcher in the machine learning group at CWI in Amsterdam which is ironically right next to, we just interviewed Max Welling a couple of hours ago, so in the same city. Wouter specializes in machine learning theory, game theory, information theory, statistics, and optimization. Wouter is currently interested in pure exploration in multi-armed bandit models, game tree search, and accelerated learning in sequential decision problems. His research has been cited around a thousand times, He's been published in NeurIPS, which is the number one machine learning conference, literally 14 times, as well as lots of other exciting publications. So it's pretty impressive. But today, we're going to talk about two of the most studied settings in control and decision theory and learning in unknown environments, which are the multi-armed bandit problem and the reinforcement learning approach. So there's a couple of key questions here, which is when can an agent stop learning and start exploiting using the knowledge that it's obtained and which strategy leads to the minimal learning time? Anyway, Wouter, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. That was very generous. It was a, it was a pleasure to be with you when you were doing your PhD. What was he like? Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe That's... one little anecdote. <laughs> 
So everybody at uh, our university had a very nice little, what are these things called? Uh, a thin client, except for Tim, who at some point came in with a truck and, and offloaded the largest monster desktop I ever saw with lights and, and everything. <laughs> and then he decided to overclock it to about twice the clock <laughs> frequency. And then at some point there were these blue screens now and then that were interrupting all the experiments going on. So I think there was a trade-off to be found. I know. That so, ironically, you were utilizing my hardware with your MATLAB experiments much more so than Quake 3 was. So gaming rigs have pros and cons for research. That's the point. Yeah, yeah I've been wanting to install Doom on our eight GPU machines for a while. So accurate. Let me jump into this bandit thing. Like it, I've been at, I've been to Tuner Rips now a few times and other conferences. And there's always new research and there's transformers and then there's GANs and there's all the fancy stuff. There's always this corner, this, and the, in the corner, <laughs> there are the bandits and it's, it never dies. Like you think that at some point it's okay, which bandit to a pull, like number three, cool. Like th th there is a multi-armed bandit problem and I guess there are like some basic algorithms, UCB and things like this. What's the continuous deal about multi-armed bandits? Why do they persist and why do they, let's say, what's, why does the field keep going with what seems to be a very basic problem? Yeah, excellent question. So... The, the way I think of it is there are two answers. So let me first give the, the small answer, which is some problems are multi-arm bandit problems. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we often see as motivation in paper is like ad placement or clinical trials. So these fit exactly in the multi-arm bandit protocol and these have like uh, large firms behind them. So there is like a financial interest in solving these problems. But I think from a more like the scientific answer is these problems are baby versions of the problem that we really would like to solve, where they are distilled to a level where all the interesting features are still there. So it's simplified, but not too much. And I think that niche is where the multi-arm bandit, that corner that you're talking about, the maybe the theory crowd at, at NeurIPS, but you see the same thing at, uh, for example, Colt, which is a even more theoretical conference. There is also a, like the multi-arm bandit contingent. So this problem, if you solve multi-arm bandit problems, you get the foundation for solving these more complicated problems. For example, in like optimization, derivative free optimization, reinforcement learning, solving like two player games these are all built with little bandit sub problems inside and there is not one bandit problem for some problems we have pretty good algorithms like you mentioned ucb which is the textbook algorithm for regret minimization but for other problems we we're still actually figuring out what is the right answer even in this very simple bandit setting and and this is where the pure exploration sort of also has its starting point. So there are lots of pure exploration problems in multi-arm bandits for which we don't quite know how to even design algorithms. Could we talk about the hierarchy here of the different approaches? So when we met, we were doing online learning and th there seems to be a taxonomy of decision theoretical approaches for doing this. I think we were working in what's called the full information domain where your actions don't really affect anything. You observe everything and the future doesn't care. And you don't really have to make many assumptions in that. So we were doing prediction with expert advice. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's this middle tier, which is bandits, where your action affects the observation. And it's quite simple uh, in a way. So your actions affect what you see, but not what happens after. And then what everyone's talking about now is reinforcement learning, uh, which is where your action affects the future state. So there's a lot of planning and thinking ahead that needs to happen. So we're kind of in, in the middle uh, of those two things. Yeah, that's exactly right. I just want to point out something. It, am I correct? By way of analogy, so the multi arm bandit is to decision theory as the urn is to probability theory, right? Like it's the simplest problem that the urn filled with different colored balls, and we can imagine 
sampling with replacement, without replacement, multiple urns that are adversarial, et cetera. It's the simplest context that, as you said, allows you to explore all the salient features of decision theory. Is that true? Yeah, so maybe we should explain what a multi r bandit is. So it's in some sense an abstraction, but so what are the ingredients? So you have these things called arms, an interface if you want. An arm is something you can, you can pull it, it's what it's called. And what it does is a sample is generated from some unknown distribution that is behind this arm. So in a multi-arm bandit, you have a collection of arms and you can ask for samples interactively. So you ask for a sample, you see what, what you got. And you go to another arm, ask for a sample, and you keep on going like this. And I guess one, uh, one popular application would be uh, clinical trials. So then you think of each treatment that you're testing as one of these bandit arms. And you think of uh, pulling such an arm as uh, getting another patient and applying this treatment to this patient and, and observing the effect. If the effect is quite fast, then you can really use the feedback from this single patient in, to update your knowledge about the treatments. So maybe for the next patient, you would like, if the, patient worked, if the treatment worked well, on the next patient, you might want to give it again. Uh, and if it didn't work so well, you may want to weight it down. Okay, That's what a, what a bandit is. So it's basically several unknown probability distributions. In some of your talks, you talk about the generalizations of this, right? There, as you said, there are many classes of, of bandits. You can generalize on the distribution of the reward, on whether they're adversarial or not, et cetera. I'm curious about one yes. thing that I, I think I missed in some of those generalizations. What's the generalization called where you, instead of pulling one arm and then updating, in parallel, you pull multiple arms with a weight? So, for example, like a portfolio distribution. I can distribute my pulls fractionally across all the arms, pull once, and then update. Does that generalization get studied much? Like in the clinical trial example, if I've got a thousand patients, yes, I allocate 10 to this treatment, 50 to that, and do so in a way that's intelligent. Is that studied? I think it's definitely a, a practical setting, especially if the treatment takes some time. So you don't want to wait for the outcome, but you want to launch a collection of experiments with certain proportions. And then after that batch, you may want to change the proportions and maybe do another batch. Does that have a name? The fractional pull or a proportional well, pull. Yeah, you can also think of it as uh, you, you're committing yourself to not have too many decision points. You could think of all these treatments as happening sequentially in time. You just decide that you only look after a thousand, after two thousand, to change your allocation. So in that sense, it's like a, a very restrained interaction compared to the one where you look after every treatment. But you may be forced to do this by the fact that you get your feedback with such a delay. Or what I was thinking about too is stock trading. If I have 2,000 stocks in which I can invest, I don't do it by putting my entire portfolio in one and then waiting till tomorrow and seeing what happens. Instead, I do a distribution across all the stocks, trade for a day or however long, doesn't matter, and then I react to it. So I'm just wondering how widely it's studied and what that class of multi-arm bandits is properly called. I see, but I, I think we, we may need to make a distinction here because in the portfolio setting, uh, I think you are in the full information setting. And the fact that you put an allocation over these stocks, it really means you are splitting your, your capital and investing portions in each. Mm -hmm. But if you have several unknown distributions, it doesn't really make sense to ask for half a sample from one of them. Outside of a pure learning context or pure exploration, it does. Because if I'm trying to... So first of all, in the stocks, it, there is a lot of unknown. You don't know what the, the distribution of returns are going to be for today. But more importantly, I am trying to learn, but I'm also trying to optimize more my portfolio. And so if I'm doing both simultaneously, that's where the fractional spread, I think, comes into play. You're... I think what, what the disconnect is maybe if you assume that you are not such a big player, you will still know what the distribution is tomorrow, even if you didn't invest into a particular stock, right? 
Like I can still look up the price of Apple tomorrow, even if I do or don't invest. I, I see the distribution is unknown, but the kind of band, I think when you pull a banded arm, you do get some sort of a reward, uh, maybe. Either the treatment works or it doesn't. But also you get information w- what what, what the, the distribution behind it is. Yeah. Maybe that's the disconnect. That would actually be my sort of question leading up. In that often in these bandit problems, you have this, you're tasked with doing something like maximizing a reward, maximizing the number of patients that are healed and so on. But you have these unknown distributions. I have 10 treatments. And I have to try them a certain amount of time before they, before I know how well they work, right? So classically, this is this exploration, exploitation trade-off. And you have a framework that you call pure exploration. Now, as I understand it, you can still use, it's not just, it's not as simple as saying, let's just do exploration. So what do you understand under pure exploration? And how does that play in? How can you to exploitation using pure exploration. All right. So I think the I think maybe let's start with an example of the two. So again, let's suppose you are running a clinical trial. So you're working in this uh, bandit interaction model where you have a patient and you can prescribe a treatment and you see the result and then you can move on to the next patient. Right? Now in this interaction you can still have several different goals. And these correspond to whether you're doing pure exploration or exploitation, exploration, exploitation. So the version where you uh, want to cure the people that are in your sample. So you want to actually cure the patients that you are treating right now. So what you want to do there is you want to learn about the treatments enough so that you can prescribe most of the time the one that works best. Because that's helping the patients. So that's something you would do for a rare disease, for example. There aren't that many patients, but you would uh, like to cure the ones that come to your clinic. The other end of the spectrum is the, the trial that you're running because you want to mass produce one of your drugs. Okay, So you're doing the trial to figure out which of these drugs you're going to roll out in the world. <laughs> So you're not really caring about curing the patients. What's important is that you want to find out which of these drugs works best. Because that's For the example, one. a COVID vaccine, for this example. This is super current, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah. So this is the regime in which the COVID trials are being done. You, you really, it's not the point to cure the patients that get, like the 50,000 people that get, that depends on which trial you're in, but the people that get a test that get vaccine right now, it's not the point to cure them or immunize them. It's the point is to know which of these vaccines is the best one, because that's the one that needs to be scaled out <laughs> to billions. And that's just too, too expensive to do that for all of them. So you want to, it turns out, and this is what, what gets me interested, is that if you want to find out which of them works best, your scheme for which treatment to assign to the patients that are in your trial is quite different between the pure exploration where you want to know which drug is the best and the, let's say the decision theoretic version or the exploitation exploration interleaving where you're trying to actually prescribe most of the time the best drug. So, that's a behavioral mm-hmm. task. Did I prescribe the right one? It's not important that I know which one is the right one at the end. I just have to have handed it out a lot. There's a new class of problem here, the ethical multi arm bandit, because now we have to consider ethics too. Yeah. So I think regulatory agencies have something to say about these things. Mm-hmm. And I think at least the traditional viewpoint is that you're not allowed to do the the one where you run the trial adaptively. So the the purpose of your trial is to uh, establish that the drug works or to figure out between several doses, which is the one that works best. And then after that sort of accredited, you can sell it. But it's 
it's very different to treat the patients in the trial. So, so is and it fair to say is it fair to say that the pure exploration setting is some sort of a setting where the reward is a sort of information gain like you you want to perform the experiment that maximally that gains you maximal information about all of the distributions there are is that that's fair? exactly right that's exactly okay. right and so it, it turns out that if you want to, so we'll be talking about these two settings a lot. So mm -hmm. let's think about them as reward maximization versus pure exploration. So in reward maximization, once you have a good idea about which drug is reasonably good, so you think this is the best, but you're actually quite uncertain. You start handing it out almost all the time. And once in a while, you throw in one of the drugs that are currently looking worse to make sure that your picture of them is not uh, perturbed by noise. So you are handing them out, but slower and slower. And you're most of the time handing out the one you think is best. Whereas in, in pure exploration, it's not important for you to, to get lots of cures. You want lots of information. <laughs> And it turns out for this, it is necessary to hand out much more often drugs that you th currently think are not the best, but you want to be very sure that they are worse than your current best looking candidate. And to be sure about that, you need to reduce the uncertainty on how good they are. Mm -hmm. And for this, you need to hand them out much more often. So if you want to quantify this in uh, regret maximization, you play suboptimal arms logarithmically often. This is in the stochastic setting, but I think this is what we're currently talking about. In the pure exploration, you're handing out suboptimal drugs linearly often. Mm -hmm. So a, a, fraction, a, a fixed fraction of your, of your trial is spent on handing out all the bad drugs just to make sure <laughs> that they really are worse. Mm -hmm. So between logarithmic and linear is an, is an enormous distinction. Yeah. Right? If you run either algorithm in the for the one task in the other one, it's really not going to do very well. It sounds like that, that a point that Yannick just made, I think, if, if I heard him correctly, is that these two extremes, in a sense, are just zero and one weights of different objective functions. So is there a sort of generalized objective function that can span these extremes between, is it just a difference in objective function, really? Yeah, so it's definitely a difference, but I, so I think I have vaguely seen some work where people are trying to interpolate, but I think, so the, the problem is you have to, it's, you're facing this impossibility that an algorithm that's good for one is not going to be good for the other. So once mm. you make an intermediate objective, mm. there's going to be a huge struggle between these two. <laughs> and so I think the algorithms that are what you what would be the holy grail is if you could make some algorithm that just is dominant in all these tasks right and such an interpolation would maybe allow you to discover it but i think instead what you get is you get something that works really well for the interpolation but it is useless at the endpoints again mm. <laughs> so th these objectives are actually very different that's could, interesting could we describe what a strategy looks like because i was reading some of the information you sent over and typically an algorithm has a, a sampling rule a stopping rule and a decision rule and that makes up a strategy and there's also some operating characteristics so there's a, a fixed confidence regime and there's a fixed budget regime which is that you say well, okay i'm only going to have a certain number of draws and then i have to stop so presumably that de determines the type of uh, algorithm that might be designed that's right so the Maybe we should talk very briefly about these. How do you measure success of your algorithm? So this is where these uh, fixed confidence, fixed budget, and maybe simple regret objectives come in. I like most fixed confidence. So let's talk about that afterwards, but maybe I should say what these other two are. So fixed budget means you commit upfront to a number of samples and you are going to try to optimize the probability that you identify at the end the, the best arm. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a fixed number of samples, you adaptively allocate them to the arms that you have, 
And at the very end, you output a recommendation for the best arm based on what you saw. So you say, treatment six is the best. That's what I think. And then in the design of your algorithm, you try to make it such that this uh, recommendation is correct with very high probability. So that's, that's one setup where you fix the sample size and you optimize the probability of getting the right answer. So that fits with clinical trials quite well, right? Yes. Right. So the other, so fixed confidence is actually the, the flip of this, where you say, I will tolerate a certain error probability, maybe 5%. So that I will make as a constraint on my algorithm. It's allowed to be wrong 5% of the time. <laughs> And given that constraint, I would like to optimize the number of samples that it takes. So few, fewer samples is better. And this allows you to stop at some earlier point. So the algorithm can decide itself when it has seen enough samples to make a recommendation. And for example, this allows you that to stop. So for example, if you see that one of your treatments is clearly much better than the rest, you don't have to go on until some prefixed sample size. You can just stop and output the answer. So yeah, you, you have a bit more freedom here. It's the stopping so rule is under the control of the algorithm too. So that's analogous to Monte Carlo versus Las Vegas algorithms. Monte Carlo being the fixed budget, I'm gonna run for a certain amount of time and then get the answer. Whereas Las Vegas, I get the answer, but I don't know how long it's gonna take. Yeah, so it's, I'm not familiar with those two, but it sounds exactly right. So when you, when we connect this to, let's say reinforcement learning with it, which is a, a thing that maybe nowadays people are more familiar with, first of all, just the observation that a lot of RL algorithms use something called epsilon greedy exploration. That sounds a lot like the kind of linear, linearly, I'm going to do something that I think is dumb, but, um, I just going to throw it in there. So I just. I don't know. I, I thought that was an that was an interesting connection. But where do you see where do you see the the connection between current reinforcement learning as we you know see it in let's say deep reinforcement learning and so on and your type of research? All right. Maybe I should give an example because there there is a motivating example that got me thinking about all of this, in which all these differences come out. I think quite clearly. And this is, suppose you are solving a game. So we've all heard about AlphaGo. So let's take that as an example. So there is a real Go board with some opponent on the other side. And it's your turn to make a move. Okay. And so, what you, you, so you're building an algorithm to, fit, to find that move for you. So what are you going to do? So you're going to run some sort of a simulation but it's all virtual. It doesn't have anything to do with the real board in which you start from the board where you are and you will allow your learning or your search algorithm to make moves. So it will make a move for you, for the opponent, for you, for the opponent, and it will at some point maybe terminate the game and look at the score, right? So your, your job is to make a learning algorithm for figuring out a good move, right? And then... So maybe without going into too much detail, but the, the search tree for Go is just massive. There's no way to, to just process everything brute force. And so the approximation that is very successful is actually based internally on sampling. So it's running randomized strategies for both players that are also designed by the learning algorithm. But this makes it a bandit style problem internally. So what internally is happening is the learning algorithm is deciding where in the tree to look a little bit more to gain some information. And so you can ask like, what should a learning algorithm be doing? And the traditional algorithms, so if you think about regret or if you think about reward maximization, then what your algorithm is doing in this search process is it's spending effort at parts of the search tree where you are winning and are you describing the monte carlo tree search that is actually used by deepmind yes yeah 
So this, I think Monte Carlo tree search is a very cool and powerful, but also a bit complicated cloud of ideas. <laughs> but if you simplify it down, it's really thinking like, where should I spend my computational budget to learn more about the best move in this starting board? Mm -hmm. Could you sketch out what's going on there with AlphaGo? Because it's, it's a convolutional neural network. It's a policy, a deep learning policy, which tells you which action to take next. And then they have this Monte Carlo tree search on the top. So it's a kind of weird mix of learning and searching all in one. So roughly what happens when the, the next move is selected? So one way to think of it, but I'm, I'm not really an expert in this, but I still, I, I think it's just nice. So w one way in which you could play Go is to have what's called an evaluation function. So you make some black box in which you input a, a board configuration and it tells you how good this configuration is for you. And then if you want to play Go, you look at your board, you look at the possible moves for you, you evaluate them and you go with the highest. And it turns out that making such an evaluation function is just extremely difficult. And so what the Monte Carlo tree search does is instead of looking at one step expansions of your current state, it's trying to go deeper, but you have the explosion of states again. So it's not uniformly expanding everywhere, but it's trying to go deeper in the places that matter. Right? Until some point where maybe still you invoke some evaluation function. But that function is now much closer to the end of the game. So it's hopefully more precise and easier to learn. And then this Monte Carlo tree search process tries to do strategic reasoning, like really min max, min max, except of course the branching factor is too high. So there are some compromises are made. But it's in a sense, it's uh, to lift a reasonable evaluation function to a very good evaluation function by spending time in the play phase instead of spending time learning more. Then one of the reasons you might want to do it is because the expressive power of your black box is not high enough to express all that if you evaluate after one step. So that function is maybe very complicated. Whereas if you go deeper down and lift the expressive power with, with some min-max search, at least some layers of it, you might have a more better evaluation function in the end. Is, is there a relation here to markets, for example? It's, it's an interesting setting where when you interact with the system or the environment, it changes. And it's a similar thing in Go. So it's not necessarily possible in one step to predict realistically what might happen in, in the future. It, it, I guess what I'm saying is there's a dichotomy between learning and search. Is search always necessary? Yeah, so I, I think the answer to the last part is no. If your evaluation function would be perfect, you don't need any search. But how to get such an evaluation function? You may not need an evaluation function if you can do search all the way till the end. So that works for small games, but it's very... Now, very quickly, this becomes intractable. The thing about games, let's see, to go towards your markets question, I think the nice thing about games is that you can, in principle, you can see the entire state space. So at least you, you know what the possibilities are. Whereas if you, the, the, the more real life you try to make it, the less practical that even that becomes. So maybe I should try to go one, one, level up the stack because we were talking about when do I want to do reward maximization versus pure exploration. So I think the, the setting where you are, you are governing computational attention <laughs> for planning purposes in this game, this is clearly a pure exploration setting. It doesn't matter if you think about games in which you lose or games about in which you win. <laughs> All right, you want to have the best possible recommendation for the move to take. Mm -hmm. And after all that process is finished, you send the move over to the real board and one move is made. But that one you can never retract. You made it, it's, it's committed. So all that process was used to make that move really good. So this is a pure exploration 
question. And I think I, I got interested in this because the methods that are used for solving that type of question are actually built on top of reward maximization, smaller parts. So I was curious whether that's a mismatch and whether that's something can be improved. Uh, so the other side is, suppose your algorithm is actually playing the game. So it can't, the only thing it can do is make a move. And then it's fed a new board and it makes a move again. And then at some point it hears, sorry, you lost. <laughs> Back to the start, right? And so there you suddenly reward is, I reached the winning state and I got some reward, right? So if you want to make an algorithm for that setting, then it suddenly matters a lot what sort of games, because those are your reward signal. It's not this planning that's happening imaginarily. I'm curious, we talked a lot about games and, and games are fun, but the problems we really want to solve are in real life. And as you just alluded to, you very quickly, even in games, can get out of context. So for example, you're playing Texas Hold'em and now you have imperfect information, again, combinatorial explosion, variable vet, bet size, et cetera. And I was really intrigued by something you said earlier about when you look at, say, a pure exploration context, you want to distribute linearly versus logarithmically. What would be, I'm wondering, is there a catalog of, if you're in this decision criteria, like according to the best multi-arm banded analysis that we have, here's a heuristic you should be following. Because it occurs to me that could be extremely useful for people designing like clinical trials, they may not understand the theory and the math behind uh, the multi-arm bandit analysis, but they could definitely understand something like, look, the, the recommendation is that you do linear proportioning or logarithmic or whatever. Do we have that kind of catalog today of heuristics for different scenarios? I, I like this question. Maybe first I put on my, my theoretician's hat and say, not, not a heuristic maybe, but do we have a real guideline? but it might be complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think here the answer, my feeling is the answer is yes. So I, I think of this as the sort of the renaissance in uh, pure exploration, because pure exploration has been around. There are some traces like all the way back to maybe even the you know, 30s, 70s, 80s. But then in the early 2000s, papers started appearing with bounds being proven for algorithms. But these were always in a worst case flavor. Mm. And then in 2016, a, a, a completely new style of algorithm design was proposed. So this is a very nice paper by Garivier and Kaufman. And so the way this works is they say, let's see if we can make very good lower bounds for this problem. So the lower bound would say, if your algorithm is doing a good job, so its recommendations are trustworthy, it makes only a small proportion of errors, then it needs to take at least a cer certain number of samples. So that's in principle bad news because it said, I can't beat this information theoretic limit. But their insight was that these lower bounds, you can make them so sharp that they actually also inform you about how an algorithm would look that matches that. So algorithms typically give upper bounds, lower bound arguments give lower bounds, and there is no real reason that these should be connected. But what they learn, what they taught us is that a specific style of lower bounds is so good that you can actually base algorithms on top of them. Hmm. So now this lower bound is, depends on the specific problem that you have. So there is one lower bound for like best arm identification, which is the sort of vanilla bandit problem. There is another lower bound for uh, game style problems. There might be another lower bound for path planning style problems, maybe Nash equilibrium style problems, uh, some robustness problems with clinical trials maybe. All of these have a different <laughs> lower bound, but the overall structure is sort of generic. So you can look at that lower bound, <laughs> fill in the details of your problem, crank the technology and out comes an almost an, it's an algorithm. Almost, you know, it's a, the main ingredient of an algorithm comes out. And so what this says is how many samples should uh, be allocated to each of these arms if I know the problem that I'm in. 
under this correctness constraint that even if you're not in that problem, you should still give the right answer. But so this, this, this can then be leveraged. So you don't know the, the specific bandit that you're in. That's actually your learning problem. <laughs> but you can estimate the bandit. Use this lower mm -hmm. bound technique to get the corresponding optimal sampling allocation and try to get that sampling allocation implemented as you're going forward. So what effort is there being made to turn this into an app? Like that, that an experimenter can just put in their criteria in a way that's very understandable and boom, here's the sample allocation. Yes. Okay. So this is my dream. I've, <laughs> I've been writing research proposals about this. I know it's impossible and it's crazy, but still I think it's a very nice goal. So I, I call it yeah. the pure exploration compiler. The compiler. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea would be, so the, the state of research right now is that people think of another interesting problem and start crunching out this lower bound, trying to uh, get some maybe closed form insights or otherwise make computational solvers for that lower bound problem. And then they have another paper where they say, I now solved pure exploration in the this and that. So right. this could be uh, like structural assumptions, prior knowledge about your bandit, because these lower bounds take that into account, or it could be a complicated out output. So let's mm, give me a path instead of an arm or mm -hmm. give me all sorts of game related things. Yeah, I, I like these games. So I come back to them a lot. But ideally what you would, you, should, you, you would like to go level up even more and say, can I make a language in which I can describe these, the, the task? And maybe the prior assumptions that I'm willing to make, sort of structural knowledge about my bandit. Can I describe mm -hmm. these and then feed that thing <laughs> into a, an algorithm that then outputs the optimal sampling strategy even? Because it can... Uh, so what, what would that look like? If there were a contract or a domain-specific language or some kind of concise description, what would the minimal contract be? So... I guess what it, it needs to support there, I think there are really two sides to this. So on the one side, you want to say, what do I, what am I willing to assume about my bandit problem? And one of the ingredients is people have often make, um, parametric assumptions about the arms. So it's Bernoulli or Gaussian, or, uh, maybe it's a uh, bounded on zero one, but otherwise non-parametric. There are standard assumptions that people are willing to make. So you, it should be able to express those. And one of the ways to uh, generalize over these parametric families is to specify the divergence function. So there is something called the kuhlbeck leipler divergence. It's defined between, it's sort of information distance between these distributions. And these lower bounds only use that about your, prob about your arms. So if you can implement this distribution, that could be a computational Oracle that you can feed into this compiler. It could also be expressed in terms of some basis functions, logarithms, exponentials, maybe a few other. Maybe it's all, it's always convex. So maybe you want to write it in such a way that is obvious. So there is this thing called disciplined convex programming, which allows you to do that. But I'm, I'm thinking of the domain knowledge maybe have to, has to go in that shape. And then there is the, how do I express when my answer is correct? For example, I want to have sort of a language in which you can express best arm, because that's the basic problem that has to be in there. These game tree problems. So where I can say there is a deep min max, but I only care about the first move. Other things you might think of are, for example, I give you some, some prototypes. So some points in some space. And I would like you to tell me, so these are maybe bandits. And I'd like you to tell me that whether the, ba uh, the so the bandit that you're in is maybe closest to one of them. <laughs> tell me which one. So do I look like this one, that one, or that one? Maybe not precisely, mm -hmm. but which one is closest? So that's also, I think, a natural problem that you'd like to be uh, expressible in the language in which you write your query. But so... I think a good starting point would be to allow linear functions of the vector of the means. So typically to describe a bandit, if it's in a parametric family, you just enumerate the means of all the arms. If it's parameterized one-to-one, -one, then that specifies everything. 
And then what it means, let's say, for, for ARM1 to be the best is that it's better than ARM2, ARM3, ARM4, ARM5, so that you, can, you could, in principle, write it as a list of linear inequalities. So that could be a way in which you do it in general. You, you list when is answer six the right one if this bunch of linear inequalities happens, right? So linear is maybe not super powerful, but you can... Maybe you can tessellate an, any complicated boundary system <laughs> with a bunch of linear... Well, I don't know, I'm just imagining does it, it. Does it need to be linear for it to be a convex problem? This lower bound has some convexity to it, but it's also inherently destroying some of the convexity that uh, might be there. And so this is one of the struggles, even if you're solving such a lower bound problem on a, on a specific instance, that some non-convexity will pop up and you have to maybe be smart. I don't think the linearity is, in, is super important. So if I give you these prototypes and I ask you to which one are you the closest, Depending on the distance that might generate some cell structure with nonlinear boundaries. The linear case is very nice if it's like a sort of a Voronoi diagram. But if the distance is not, uh, I guess you can maybe figure out, maybe Bregman divergences would still have linear boundaries. But if it's something else, I think you might get some sort of soap, what is it, sheet? some partition of, of the bandit space where each cell corresponds to the cluster of bandits on which some answer is yeah. what you should be saying. But yeah, so we're currently quite far from even thinking about this question. We have just barely started because even in specific problems where sort of the answer map is completely fixed, we're, we're already struggling to solve this lower bound problem. And it, it looks like we have to come up with new tricks every time. So that tells you we, d we don't have the, the full catalog yet of stuff to make this compiler. Because <laughs> if, if every time you look at a problem, you find a new trick, then you okay. don't have all the tricks yet. No, exactly. <laughs> to spin this a little bit further, it, you talk about clinical trials and so on. And for sure, that's important. But it seems that the framework is applicable to so much more than your kind of this standard setting. I'm, I'm thinking of any agent being deployed anywhere as something like this, for example. Yeah, let's go back to your, your classic reinforcement learning problem. You have a robot, you deploy it in a house, and the first thing it could do is simply to go and explore, right? Such that it can then, after that, do a certain task or any task as good as possible. And this connects with this, do you know this notion of things like universal value functions or like things like where an agent is deployed in a world and all it does is it learns to get from one state to the other state and it chooses those states by itself. So it always selects two states and then it says, how can I get from here to there? And then it learns this so that it's once the time comes, it's maximally prepared to do any task. Is there an inherent connection? Do you think bandit framing it as a bandit problem is more principled or is it different or? No, I think again, these bandit problems, they are just to help you think about this type of problems in the most simple setting that you can mm -hmm. imagine. But in practice, I think you're often your actions uh, influence the state. So I think one, one thing that I've recently uh, people looking at is what's called reward free exploration. So you're placed in an uh, MDP, which is the typical arena for reinforcement learning. So you can take actions and you will change the state, but the reward is not there. Mm -hmm. So you just see, I was here, I did this action, I went there. And then from there, I did another action, I went there. <laughs> and maybe one, once in a while, you come back to a state where you've been before. And so your goal is to map out the map in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then at the very, as in, in, in such a way, so this is then the reward free exploration goal, learn this map in such a way that if I then give you a reward function, you can actually give, execute a, a near optimal policy as a result of your map making. Yep. And no matter what reward function I then lay on top, you should be able to now have such a good map <laughs> that you can get to the high rewards in, in that way of measuring. 
So that's in some sense a pure exploration problem because you're, you're doing this map making without any reward, just mm. trying to get your uncertainty about the MDP down in a smart uniform way, right? It's, you, have to get, you have to go everywhere to get a yep. good map. If there are regions that you, you, you don't even see, then if they have high reward, you don't know how to get there. Or I'm sensing a deep connection here. Uh team to the Kenneth Stanley novelty search. So we're definitely going to have to mention this when we have that conversation. Um, <laughs> you know, is abandoning there, objectives and just searching. Is there, a, is there any consideration of causality in the field? For example, I can, if I have a patient, maybe I can give them a treatment now, but I could also have instructed them three months earlier. I could have instructed them to just quit smoking. Or two years earlier, I could have recommended them a better diet and so on. And these things causally influence each other. And I now have to figure out what is best to do when the things have some, some kind of causal structure, which node in the causal structure am I intervening on? Things like this. Is there any consideration or is this a completely different field? Causality and exploration touch in multiple places. Mm -hmm. So one, one, one way to look at causality, it's, uh, you can use it as a restriction on sort of a joint distribution of random variables, but it also tells you how they behave if you take certain actions. Mm -hmm. But in, in some sense, without the causal model, ev every action could do whatever. <laughs> and with the causal model in place, that restricts quite a lot what your actions would do. So if you have a causal model underlying some bandit arms, so those would be your random variables, plus a causal model behind, then that's prior knowledge that would allow you to, with fewer samples, recommend a good one, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are papers that talk about that. Another thing you could try is to say, I don't know about causal models, but I'm willing to discover them if they are present. But then I think the causality literature is trying to figure out this question. Can you even <laughs> learn the causal model from doing interventions or experiments? It's maybe the same thing. And I think the answer is often no and sometimes yes. But in some sense, trying to figure out the correct model from observations that you actively and in or interactively place is what both of these are after. <laughs> yeah. Does a causal, <clears throat> excuse me, a causal model behind the arms, if you will, does that fall somewhere in between the normal multi-arm bandit and an adversarial multi-arm bandit? Like is the adversarial multi-arm bandit just a causal one or is it even more generalized than a causal model? I think the adversarial one is really in a category on its own. <laughs> so in the stochastic bandit model, even if you have uh, prior knowledge about the uh, structure or a like causal structure, or it could be like families or, you know, joint distributions, all these things mm -hmm. are in a stochastic uh, setting mm -hmm. where if you've figured out all the parameters, you know, everything. So in some sense, there is the thing to learn exists. It is the full parametrization of the true model. <laughs> and it is within scope to actually figure that out. So sometimes the parameter dimension is large, but typically if you keep on doing the right experiments, at some point you're just zooming in on that parameter more and more. Whereas in an adversarial setting, there is some opponent that can put the rewards or, or control the samples. And at that point, all the structure evaporates, right? Even samples from the same arm don't have to look like each other. There could be patterns that in time just appear and go away and mm -hmm. you typically see the learning rates worsen but if you look at regret upper bounds you go from the logarithmic to the square root regime the algorithms become much more pessimistic and the amount of exploration you need even for reward maximization is just higher because you have to catch the opponents changing the patterns mm -hmm. In some sense, it's funny, but I always, so exploration is in that sense, you use it as a threat. So I, I'm going to look, I'm going to sample, but in principle, I might look everywhere. 
<laughs> right, right. So don't try to hide a reward that I'm not seeing because I'm, I'm going to look. <laughs> uh, and by now and then, by, by having support in your exploration on all the arms, you can make sure that the, your, the probability that uh, the adversary packs a lot of reward in one place and you miss it is small. Could we touch on optimization? Because this is something that should be familiar to most of the deep learning folks that watch this podcast. So we're in the regime of convex optimization. And you mentioned in one of your talks, actually, because clearly what we want to do is minimize the regret. And the regret is the difference between our approach and the best possible sequence of, of actions. And one of the things that we need to do with stochastic gradient descent is, is add regularization. And you mentioned a couple of examples of this. So there's one, which is the FTRL style, which is the follow the regularized leader, which is penalizing eccentricity. And then there's another one, which is mirror descent, which is uh, I don't, I, I, it's kind of similar to what we do in kernel methods, right? It's transforming it into some into some Hilbert space and then doing some update and then transforming it back again, as I understand. Doing this mirror descent gives you a better convergent behavior. I think it's instead of being a square root of n over k, it's a square root of log n over k. But yeah, could you give us some insight into some of the optimization approaches? Yeah, so how to place optimization and connect it to our conversation we've had so far. So one of the things you can say is a, a multi-arm bandit is in some sense a very simple optimization problem where I need to find the best out of a finite set of arms. But you could extend this and say, let's imagine that there is an infinite parameter space of arms with some function that I don't know, which maybe controls the, let's say there is maybe some noise, so it controls the mean. <laughs> and I'm trying to go to the minimum of that by carefully outputting these iterates and asking for samples at the iterates. So this is one perspective, it's called uh, bandit optimization, where yeah, you're trying to see how many iterates do I need to get close to a certain point. It's typically done without gradients. So if you add, but in optimization where people are designing these losses them, themselves, right? It's just some misclassification error on an example or something that you randomly draw from your from your training set then the loss function so you can compute gradients so then it's like first order gradient based optimization and then i guess the other connection is you could also say this is in some sense more related to the full information case so let's see is that my misunderstanding so mostly we use these convex optimization approaches like stochastic um, gradient descent in the full information regime. It's true you use them in the full information regime. And on the other hand, you're typically only using a gradient as your conduit. You're not taking the full sample or the example on which, right? In, in stochastic gradient descent, you take one example from your training set, you compute the the gradient of the loss function of your current parameters on that example. And then you update your parameters with a gradient step. So you could have used more information about your example, but instead you chose to only look at the gradient. So that is in some sense a, a self-imposed restriction. I mean, you, yeah, you could think about Hessians and then very quickly you don't want to because the demand that is just <laughs> intractably big. But you, just to say, you could do other things with your data. One thing that I like to think about, but it's maybe somewhat removed from our current conversation, is the online convex optimization setting. So there, you're not thinking about optimizing a fixed function or a stochastic function where you draw examples from some distribution or training set, but you're thinking about an adversary picking those functions for you. And then it turns out that these algorithms for optimizing some of adversarially chosen convex functions, they are super strongly related to algorithms for full information and, and bandit learning. The idea behind is uh, very similar. Like you mentioned, these uh, frameworks for obtaining algorithms like mirror descent, FTRL. Uh, there is also the sort of exponential weights family which sometimes 
is a special case of mirror descent and also vice versa. It's quite intriguing. But anyway, so ma making algorithms for that gives you inspiration on making algorithms for full information and bandit problems and vice versa. Let me just say one of the things that I find extremely uh, intriguing about designing such algorithms is that you, know, you want to make a, a guarantee about the performance of these algorithms to say not just it works on this data set, but to say, I promise that it will work so and so well on your data set that I haven't even seen yet. So you like to give such guarantees. But to make such guarantees, you typically have to be quite uh, pessimistic about what's going to happen. Your data is typically adversarial and <laughs> you make some bounds here and there. And so these guarantees come out often pessimistic. If you run your algorithm in practice, it will actually perform better. So you might say, that's fine. I will just run it in practice and it will perform, perform better. And I'm happy with that. But you might be a bit greedier and say, I want to guarantee that if your problem is of a specific kind, maybe somewhat non-adversarial or simpler, then my algorithm will actually guaranteed perform better than its case guarantee. So I think you mentioned in the introduction this accelerated learning. So that's what this is about. So you want to make a claim that says my performance is such and such. So that if you look at the ingredients of that claim, you can see that, oh, if my data are of a certain easy type, this uh, closeness to optimality goes down much quicker than if I'm in a worst case example. So that reminds me of a, a question I wanted to ask you, because you've just been talking about if the more pessimistic you have to be, the, the looser the bounds get, eventually we just get the Markov inequality or something like that that's not so useful, maybe. but. Another dimension that you mentioned, I think this is in a video I saw a presentation that you made, is that why do we care about asymptotic optimality to start with? Because we're not doing things infinitely. We're doing things with finite samples and we care about getting the most value out of those. And one point you made is that, okay, at least sometimes the algorithms we develop when we consider asymptotic optimality uh, turn out to be good ones or maybe even the best ones that we've discovered. I'm sure a lot of it has to do with just analytic simplicity. It's easier to consider asymptotic cases. I wonder if you can talk more about the first point there, which is that sometimes they turn out to be the good algorithms and sometimes they don't. I'm just really curious about how that plays out in practice. All right. Yeah. So this is maybe, this is back to the pure exploration bandit setting. So as I said before, I, I think there was this uh, renaissance so this relates to that. So what happened in the Renaissance? Previously, there were worst case guarantees and algorithms that gave them, right? And you always wonder, is such a worst case guarantee any good? Or, or is there still room to improve the algorithm and get just a uniformly better guarantee? Mm -hmm. So that's why you are thinking about lower bounds, because if you match your upper bounds with a lower bound, there is no way to make it better in all cases. And there was a, there, so there is a, for lower, it's often very difficult to be extremely precise. So with lower bounds and upper bounds, you typically make these statements that have a, like a big O <laughs> and say up to a constant factor that I'm not going to specify and who knows how mm -hmm. big it is, but you can't do better than this and I can do at least this good. Sure. Now in the Renaissance, it turns out <laughs> that it is possible to match the lower bound which itself is not which itself is not up to an unspecified constant. The lower bound turns out to be precise, and you can asymptotically match it. So this means that there are no big O's, <laughs> right? In the limit of large samples, you're doing exactly what the lower bound says, up to some overhead that is sort of vanishing compared to the main term. Mm. So that is very good news. You, it, it says you can get extremely close to optimality on large samples. So this is what this asymptotic optimality, the excitement that it gave, like we can have the constant factor equal to one on top of the lower bound in our algorithms. We can really squeeze everything out. Yep. But so this argument was asymptotic. And of course that's, it still makes you wonder, okay, but at what sample sizes do these asymptotics start kicking in? Mm -hmm. 
And the hope would be it's all fine and they always kick in early. So then the theory guys have some work to figure that out. But in practice, I can just use these algorithms because they were great. So that's the, the best case scenario. Turns out it's a, bit, it's a bit mixed. So depending on the problem in which, you, in which you're working, as I said, these lower bounds are the template. They specialize to the problem in different cases. So for best arm, I think the lower bounds, the, the asymptotic algorithms, so based on these lower bounds, actually the asymptotics kick in quite early. So for practical sample sizes, these algorithms are, are just the, the best we have. For other problems, like the game tree search problems, it's a bit different. And I think the, one of the interesting and also not so well understood things is that the lower bounds for game trees tell you that some of the states in your game tree, you don't have to evaluate them at all. So this is a pruning related issue. Right? If you do, for example, alpha, beta search, you're also not going to look at some subtrees. Mm -hmm. This is different because it's like stochastic evaluation. So you're, you have to revisit things. It's not you can really prune something. But these lower bounds say some states don't need any samples. But I can still give the correct answer even if I haven't seen any samples from this arm. But that says, is something that is dangerous because if you follow a strategy that does not sample in one spot and your estimates are not right, then it might be that you're never going to correct your estimates because to correct them, you would have to see samples from mm. really that place. Mm -hmm. So to get that, there is a self-confusing possibility in these algorithms, which you fix by doing sort of a baseline sampling everywhere at the low frequency so that it doesn't kill your guarantees but that still your estimates eventually converge. So in the asymptotic optimality, you don't see this. It's just a thing that eventually disappears. But in practice, it, I think it matters a lot how you actually do this. And so the asymptotics don't give any guidance as to how to do it. They just say, make sure that in the limit, it disappears. <laughs> but we haven't figured out quite how to do this. There are now... And an, like another point touching on your question is that these asymptotic optimality results are just some intermediate stage, right? Nobody is happy and thinks that's the place to stop. Mm. It's just, if they give good algorithms, then in practice we can go. And in theory, we have to work that out. If they don't give good algorithms, it means we have to understand it at an even finer scale and, and maybe actually sit down do the work and get these finite time results also figured out that is typically much harder because then all these other details that you could sweep under the rug with asymptotics actually start mattering so we're seeing the first sort of non-asymptotic bounds both for regret minimization with instance optimal results and also pure exploration they are happening but they are not at the stage where where we believe that the sort of the lower order terms that are being added to make things non-asymptotic, that those are actually correct. We believe they are gross overestimates with all sorts of artifacts of the analysis, etc. So we're not at this. And maybe they are guiding your algorithm. <laughs> so we, we don't have this interaction figured out that we, I think we, there is work needed to press those down and make the algorithm adjust so that you can do that. Amazing. I, I, I was wondering where in all of this do, let's say, something like features come in? Because we've now, we've seen, okay, you have X treatments and treatments are simply labeled one through 10. You want to find the best one and so on. But now let's, let's reverse and let's say I have these 10 treatments and I have a pool of a thousand patients and all of these patients, they have different ages and weights and whatnot and previous diseases and whatnot. And now not only do I have to select the right treatment, but I also have to say, which patient do I want to try it on in such a way that at the end, I know the most things about most treatments on most patients where, how does that come in and does deep learning play a potential role in that once you deal with features. All right. So 
I think the, the standard way to add features to a bandit problem is called the contextual bandit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the model there is that, in, as you say, a patient comes in, their age, their shoe size, their coordinates. And the goal is not to find the best treatment, but the goal is to learn a function that takes such a feature vector mm -hmm. and says, for you, the best treatment is this drug. Yeah. Right? So it could still be a finite number of drugs, mm -hmm. but now instead of learning one out of five, <laughs> you're learning among all functions from the feature space to a five element, let's say, set of drugs. Okay, so the object you're trying to learn just became a lot more complicated mm -hmm. because there might be lots of functions mapping between those two. So you typically need, if you want to, so uh, the general problem, if you have no structure whatsoever in the class of functions you are considering is hopeless. Because you, you could have, you, if the features are random with like a, no limits on the support, you're never going to see the same patient twice. Yeah. And if the best treatment for everybody is completely arbitrary, there is no learning from the patients you treated. So then people look at function classes, like what sort of mappings from the features to the best drug am I going to try to learn from? And so... Because you have two questions. You have the question like, how does it affect the sample size? So I'm learning something more precise. So I expect to do better if I learned it, but I also expect to need much more samples to learn mm. it. Mm. So you'd like to know, for example, suppose I do only linear maps or maybe softmax if you want from features to drugs. How many samples do I expect to learn such a map? Is that sort of practical or not? Maybe it is a function of the feature vector size or something. And the other thing is, how am I going to learn such a function in the first place? What often happens is that this is done through a reduction. So you reduce to supervised learning, where you say, I'm going to create a data set with all the observations that I uh, made in the past. Mm -hmm. And I will feed that to a supervised learning system to output me a classifier that gives me the mapping that I want. So this is where all your supervised learning tools could do that job. Yeah. Yeah. So th I think this is a very hot and current topic to do this. I think there are computational barriers as well. So it's, it's not all rosy. <laughs> People are often going that there are several papers that work in sort of an Oracle model where they say minimizing the loss over the function class, I assume that's tractable. We, right. we know it's not, but let's assume it and then <laughs> see if we can get this statistical problem under control of how to do the sampling aspect. So here's a, maybe a, a crazier idea. If I, I don't know how much time you spend in the deep learning world, but there is a class of models called transformers. Then they have this attention mechanism and the attention mechanism basically maps a set to another set. And it does so by computing features on each pair of these sets, which means that you have a quadratic blow up in memory and in compute time. And a lot of people have tried to make that mapping sparse between the things. Is there any use to formulate this as a bandit problem? As a, as, an, as a, let's say, maybe even a pure exploration problem where you say, here are incoming features of my sample in my neural network layer, and I have to select a subset of those to propagate to the next layer because I, I simply can't compute all of them. Is this a viable bandit problem or is the work required to determine which of the features I pass on? Is that just the same as actually computing them. You see where I'm getting at? Yeah, Can I so put a bandit a... problem within my neural network to make it sparse? Or is that, does that defeat the purpose because the bandit itself would compute all of these things anyway? So I, I'm not sure, I'm not, that, I'm not familiar with the transformer specifically, mm -hmm. but I, I have worked on some problem that has at least, well, pretty related when you work with the learning from, from features, a thing that is often coming up is that you would like to have sort of a covariance matrix 
of those features. Yes. Sometimes you need this sort of to normalize things or whiten things or to like also in, but also in adversarial learning, these matrices come up. And so once the dimension gets a million <laughs> or depends on your budget, let's say over a thousand, 10,000, it's really annoying or impossible to store that matrix. And so you can ask like, how much do I lose if I approximate that matrix and throw away some of the entries? And a thing that you can do is you can say, let's try to maintain a low rank factorization of it and throw away the rest. And it turns out that uh, in terms of optimization performance, you're going to lose something because mm -hmm. you're not keeping everything. But it is a manageable amount in the sense that I guess the rates are known for these type of approaches. If you maintain this, this matrix, you would be in a logarithmic regret regime. If you don't maintain it and do maybe gradient descent, it would be a square root. And if you do a matrix uh, sketching technique that sort of adaptively tries to put some things in the matrix and kick some other things out, and there are some SVDs on the way, etc. <laughs> but the, the upshot is that you get logarithmic regime on the important dimensions in your problem, which is also the ones that you are approximately keeping in the matrix. And then there is a square root T regret on everything that you dropped. But hopefully the magnitude of the dropped things, yeah. which is multiplying that square root, is small enough that you were okay dropping it. Mm -hmm. And so there are interesting trade-offs there, making completely impractical algorithms rather practical. So maybe something like that could also work for the transformer case. Yeah, and it's important but, to realize already when you're talking about a pairwise matrix, that's already a reduction of the problem space because now we're not considering three-way, four-way, in-way kind of functional interactions between things. Like this is a problem that crops up even in old school kind of, I've got my correlation matrix and I reduce it to some eigenvectors and now I've lost information, but not only that, but you've lost things beyond pairwise relationships. It's always, I guess, maybe amuse me or something, surprise me at how much we have to reduce the complexity of the real world just to get it down to things that we can mathematically address. Indeed. You, you said yeah. in one of your other presentations, uh, Wouter, as well, that there's also a moderate confidence regime, which is because we spoke about the fixed confidence regime, where it's dependent on the problem parameters other than the, is it the, the lowercase delta that is in our problem? That's right. In this asymptotic optimality, you're saying, let's look at what happens if I make my confidence parameter go to zero, which means that you're, al you're allowing fewer and fewer mistakes, because that's what the confidence is, your mistake budget, the probability that you make a wrong output. So if you make that super tiny, what, how does your sample complexity go up? That's the asymptotic regime. And so... All the things that, and what you often see is you have sort of a, in your sample complexity, a contribution that scales with that confidence and other stuff that doesn't. And the asymptotic says, okay, only the factor in front of the term that scales with the confidence is important because the rest vanishes eventually. So the moderate confidence research line is a, the counter <laughs> revolution to that, which says, come on, in practice, Delta is 5%, 1%, maybe space grade a millionth, but that's it. <laughs> and if at those uh, deltas, those second order terms <laughs> are actually the dominating ones, then your asymptotically optimal picture is not even telling us what's really going on. And so then the question becomes like those other terms, what do they actually depend on? So how do they scale maybe with the number of arms? or maybe with some other structural parameters that I have in my prior knowledge, things like that. And, and can they be dominant? So there are some papers that have, okay, let's say, so the holy grail would be some expression that takes, that is not asymptotic, takes all these effects into account <laughs> and ideally has a lower bound that says you need all these things as well. And, but we're not there, but we do have cases where there are examples where the lower order terms are the dominant ones. So the terms that don't depend on the confidence determine the sample complexity. 
and they have interesting scalings with the number of arms and, and these other problem parameters. Hmm. So th that is really a criticism to the asymptotic optimality saying you're looking at a, a very special tail end of a big elephant <laughs> that has much more to it. You, we're not done. The, so I take this as, as a very, as a sort of interesting in the sense that that means that the algorithms that we currently have are probably not going to survive and be in the canon. <laughs> and there is a new class of algorithms. If we just push a little bit, it's just a little bit behind the horizon that would be getting those, those terms and ideally both of them. <laughs> a question though. How, so how much would that refinement, let's say that, so today we have some algorithms and, and in one case we do linear allocation and another it's logarithmic. And you made this comment earlier that, that there's this very steep kind of energy barrier there, if you will, where if you care about one thing, it drives you over to a particular class of algorithm. So somebody comes along and they, they present us with God's theta bound or something that has all the little terms in there. I'm wondering like how much that's going to change like practical implementation of those algorithms. Because again, I'm coming back to, this seems like it could be extremely useful for policymaking. We had this talk about algo shambles in the UK where they were trying to do college admissions and they had an algorithm that would do things like no top tier students ever came from this school, then we're going to allocate zero budget to them. And Yannick brought up maybe some kind of Laplacian smoothing would have helped out there. And that's very that that's a multi-arm bandit, you know, problem. So I'm curious how much you think these refinements to those bounds would qualitatively change the algorithms that are optimal. Yeah. So I think unfortunately the algorithms are very different. Mm. So the, the, the examples in which the non confidence terms are dominant have different lower bounds with that term being the dominant one. And then the algorithms that match those look very different again. So that says that if you want to get both of these, we have to interpolate somehow in a smart way. In a, another way of looking at it is saying those asymptotically optimal algorithms are not maybe safe for practice. A theoretical reason <laughs> for why they aren't safe is that they're getting this other thing wrong. That's too bad. Yeah. So in terms of what you want to do in practice, I mean, if you are in an example where you can simulate and try your algorithm on, on representative problems that are not exactly the one you have, but you believe they're close, you can just test run your algorithm and see uh, if you trust it. So the sampling rule might be uh, suboptimal for the, for the regime or not. But as long as your stopping rule is safe, maybe you take maybe a little bit too many examples, but you're still giving the right answer. So you can be safe while at the same time be a little bit heuristic. And I think at least for these best arm type problems, you will get the best performance by doing that. So I think if I had to implement them in practice for some drug trials, maybe I would still consider doing them. See, I love that. I love how this is one thing I always found really interesting about algorithms is like he's saying, you, you set up this problem and, and here's our objective function. And then you figure out however you figure it out, what an optimal algorithm is. And a lot of times they come up to be these sort of very simple rules, like you, you allocate logarithmically or linearly or whatever. And they're quite robust to changes to the objective functions and problems like that. But it sounds like in some of these scenarios, he's talking about the algorithm, the optimal algorithms are not that stable. You go and you, you tweak your asymptotic bound or, or something, and now suddenly it's telling you to do square root allocation instead of linear. Uh, kind of funny, you know, it's, it's a bit unfortunate because you would hope that for things like the algo shambles or whatnot, if we just did a little bit of multi-arm bandit proper analysis, we could come up with an algorithm that's objectively fair and achieves our goal of bettering society as a whole, that sort of thing. Yeah, but it's, I think the fact is that you have to make sure that in the limit, they somehow converge. So they, they can be arbitrarily bad in the short term, 
But then in in the long term, as long as they converge, it reminds me of like in optimization, there are a lot of these papers that do all, all kinds of stuff where as long as at the end you converge, it's fine. Like thing yeah this algorithm reaches global convergence in deep learning and all you have to do is like noise around until you are in the region of the local of the like in the region around the optimum where it's approximately convex and then you converge but as long as you noise around all like th this this algorithm design often the algorithms are designed with this asymptotic thing in mind and they pay the price of being arbitrarily bad in the short term or in the near right. term. And that's, it seems, yeah, it seems, as you've said, Walter, this seems a bit sad and also is not super clear what then you should do in practice. Yeah. And in, as in bandits, in optimization, where I know a little bit of stuff, we're not there yet to say, look, here is a good algorithm for your problem. All we know is that what tends to work well in a thing and almost nobody cares about the asymptotic properties of an optimization algorithm when you apply it no one cares we just use adam or sgd or <laughs> whatever worked last time and then people have their favorites i don't know does that happen to you in the bandit world where i know people they, they'll come like you just need to use RMS prop. It's better every time. <laughs> and then they'll just use that. And it like, there's literally no difference. Just use Thompson sampling. They're, Don't, they're convinced. Uh, that's, that's they're convinced. Does that happen in the bandit world in practice that people go, no, I use this one. It's always better. Murphy sample. <laughs> but uh, may maybe they do it with, they tried it. So I yeah. think one of the sort of large application cases is uh, advertisements on websites. Mm -hmm. where every round is a new user. Maybe it's contextual, maybe some of the country, browser history, or where, yeah, depending on who you are. Some things about the user, maybe you use it, maybe you don't. And you have to recommend one of a small set of advertisements. In principle, that if you keep on you know, pushing the same advertisement, at some point the attention of the users will decline. <laughs> And, and so it's not an IID stochastic setting mm -hmm. or people are even better. Like your competitor is making a counter advertisement and now yours looks ridiculous instead of fun, like you intended it anyway. So then you'd go, oh, okay, maybe I should use an adversarial bandit algorithm. And then you see your revenue just drop. <laughs> so it's safe, but it's also doesn't work that well. Yeah. So right. you just go back to the stochastic case where the assumptions are violated, but not that much to actually be heard. <laughs> and it's more aggressive. So you run it. Of or course, if you believe the, if you believe the sort of, I don't know if hype is the right word, but the exaggeration, if you will, from the social dilemma, uh, the social media companies are out there scooping up all the multi-arm bandit experts to design like highly optimized you know, algorithms to poke them with, with certain ad. Uh, whereas in practice, I don't know what I've seen is most of the time it's, it's something simple. Like, we, we want to make this UX improvement. So we're going to, we're going to run half the users on the new one and half on the old one for a week and uh, see which one does better. <laughs> it's just like these simple rational number divisions of things. Is there, is there any things that you are excited about that are in the near future of the pure exploration field of things where that could make a big impact or just that seem like lots of fun to you? Yes, I, I think this thinking about this pure exploration compiler, I think if we get that, it would be massively useful because the user can specify what is the thing I want to learn and what mm. is the knowledge that I have and now synthesize me an algorithm, yep. right? With, without having a researcher working for you or... So any sort of steps towards that, I think are going to be fun and, and useful at the same time. And fun, I guess for me, it means you discover sort of new ways of designing algorithms, right? These mm -hmm. tricks that I was talking about. Every time you get such a trick, I, I don't know, you really feel like I discovered something that nobody has seen before. It's super exciting. And then you're building this library for this sort of grand goal. I think. Yeah, someone mentioned the Murphy sampling in this regard. It's also one of these algorithms 
that unfortunately it as far as we know it only applies to one specific scenario but it is uh, competitive for that one yeah I, this algorithm is is fun it's maybe i can explain it briefly so you're in a situation where i call it a tree of depth one and a half so the situation is as follows you can either you have a binary choice so you can either have some fixed reward or you can make choice two and in choice two there is a multi-arm bandit so there is a bunch of choices but those are controlled by an opponent okay so the opponent is going to give you the reward from the bandit which is the worst so you can either have fixed reward or go to this bandit in which you will get the worst of the arms so now you can have some time with this bandit before we actually play this game so you can take samples from these arms to figure out how bad is the worst arm among these <laughs> right so you do your learning for a while you figure it out and then you play the actual game do we go for the fixed reward or do we get to the bandit so the question is how to organize this learning in this bandit with this extra little binary tree right above it. And uh, so for this, we developed the, the Murphy sampling algorithm. So if you're familiar with Thompson sampling, it's a super nice idea. You have some priors on the quality of your arms. You get samples and you update those priors to become posteriors. And then there is the rule for taking samples, which is you take a posterior sample and you look at the best arm on that sample. And that's the one that you play and get a new sample from. Yeah, there's always samples on two levels with Thompson. <laughs> the one in your fantasy and the one in the bandit. Mm -hmm. So you sample a parameter from your posterior and go with the best arm on that parameter to play. And what Murphy sampling does, it's a nice variation. It says, do a posterior sample and look at the worst arm. If it is worse than that fixed value that I can also have, then let's play that arm. But if all the arms are better than that fixed value, then I don't like this posterior sample. So I reject and get and resample until I get a one where there is an arm below this threshold. So the way I look at it is this algorithm, it takes posterior samples, but it's conditioning on these bad bandits where the, the worst arm is worse than the constant value. And it only likes to think about those. And it turns out this is the right thing to do, even if you're in a good bandit. So that's weird because you're never thinking about good bandits. This algorithm mm -hmm. <laughs> is only considering bad bandits. So it, that's why it, we call it Murphy sampling. <laughs> but for some funny mathematical coincidence or, or not, but we don't know, only thinking about bad bandits still give you exactly the right behavior on the good bandits too. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these tricks. So there are, there should be a library of tricks that look like Thompson sampling yeah. with variations that include sort of rejection sampling, maybe some interesting conditioning events. Can you create one of those libraries? It could be very yeah, useful. I don't know yet what should be in it. <laughs> so I, I have this one example. <laughs> then we try, I tried with a master student from Italy. He was a bright guy to extend it to actual depth too. So I said, I called this depth one and a half because it was a choice between a constant and a bandit. Mm -hmm. So just the simple extensions where you can have, you have a binary choice between two bandits, but in, in each of them, you will get the sample from the worst arm. Do you want to go left or right? And you have some prior time in which you can interact with both bandits before you make your choice. So we thought hard about uh, making a Thompson sampling based algorithm for this. But uh, in the end, we couldn't figure it out. So we don't know if it's possible. But until now, we weren't able to do it. So again, then, yeah, you need more tricks, smarter tricks, or it's impossible. But that would probably also be very hard to show. 
Amazing. Dr. Walter Kulin, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. It was, it was great a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for all your questions. I yeah. learned more than I ever have. And I have had three lectures on bandits, <laughs> <laughs> like full semesters. <laughs> goes to show you the uh, Socratic method or dialogue is the best way to learn, huh? Right. True. I think you were connecting all these things to, to lots of other topics in machine learning, which I think is, is very nice. I think you're getting a good uh, overview of what's going on by making these uh, interviews. And yeah. Yannick was... video incoming. Well, thank you so much, yeah, for being here. This was lots of fun. Amazing. Right, thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you. Real pleasure. That's a wrap. Thanks a lot. Thank Amazing. Oh, I, I really appreciate it, Walter. And uh, yeah, I'd, we'd love to have you um, on again soon. So thank you so much. Really was a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure. And, cool. And Take care, guys. Have a great weekend. Good luck with the podcast. <laughs> Thanks so much. Cheers. Oh, yeah. You'll see it soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thanks. We've got a tiny bit of bonus postscript content here. Unfortunately, we don't have a recording for Wouter, but there are some nice contributions from Keith and Yannick, so I've just left this in. I'm not sure if you're familiar with kind of the theory of computation sort of literature. You always, I know you've heard about NP complete and whatnot. The funny thing is NP stands for non-deterministic Turing machine. And so this is like a Turing machine that it, anytime it needs to branch, it can just explore both both avenues in parallel simultaneously. And then no matter how much it branches, whatever the sort of results are, can be coalesced back to the final answer. So that's obviously an extremely powerful uh, machine. And quantum doesn't even get to that level. It, it's a step below that where it can evaluate some finite number of very specifically superimposed sorts of states. And we have to be clever about how to use it. But I just find it's, it's so hyped. It's like at the peak almost not. I don't know where it is in the Gartner hype cycle, but it's it's not going to solve all our problems. Damn. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should like do street talk quantum something. Like it's yeah. sometimes I hear companies getting funding for things that have nothing to do with what the company does, but they like right. frame their work in a way is oh yeah, we got some COVID funding. It's like you do, you're like, you do nothing, nothing. Quantum, with quantum like, bottled oh, yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? it's, <laughs> it's all a matter of framing to get these government money things. Blockchain coffee. Do you, uh, do you have to? We, we commented on that on our last video or, or the one before the last, which diverged into the woes of academia. And you brought up this repeatability uh, crisis. Yeah, I found that politics and money really corrupted the process. And I was really naive as a kid. I thought it was really the ivory tower and that all that mattered was the truth. And, and if you could demonstrate the truth, everyone else just had to spontaneously accept it and accept the new truth and move forward. And it's not like that at all. It's just so much hype and politics and sort of religions and acolytes that follow the religious leaders and, yeah. and vociferously attack anyone that disagrees. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you back very soon.